Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Grace City. Would you all please stand with me this morning? And also, if you're out in the courtyard, go ahead and start making your way. We're going to be starting in just a few moments. Well, welcome to Grace City. So good to see you all here. Um, before we get started, we always like to read some scripture. Um, so this morning, we're going to be reading out of Psalms 103, verses 10 through 12. Does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. That's the truth this morning. That's the truth every day that we believe here at Grace City. So as we sing these next few songs, uh, just, just think about that truth that we've been saved uh, by the blood of Christ. We're going to sing with us. It's in the fourth throne. Perfect plea of great high priest whose name is love. Whoever lives and pleads for me, my name is graven on his hands, my name is written on his heart. I know that while he stands, he can Satan tempts me, when Satan tempts me to despair, and tells me of the guilt within, of what I look and see in there, an end to all my sin. Because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted. Spotless righteousness, the great unchangeable I am, the King of glory and of grace. One with Himself, I cannot die. My soul is purchased by His blood. My life is Sin was 
washed away in your blood Too much to make sense of it
brought us back. You've redeemed us. God, and now you are our foundation. And we hold on to you, God. God, we thank you for your grace and we thank you for that love. It's true every morning, God. I pray that we would remember that this morning. And that we would be open to what you have for us. Go ahead and take a seat real quick. Okay, it's so great to see you all here. Uh, if you notice some kids uh, dancing around when we're singing, um, they're dismissed. They can follow that blue surfboard sign up there. This is what they're learning. They're learning about Israel's unfaithfulness, God's faithfulness. Uh, from Judges 1 through 3. Uh, also, this morning we have GC Youth. Yeah, so let's give a round of applause for GCU. If you are a middle school student, um, you can go ahead and follow that sign over there that says youth. Follow that outside. If this is your first time to Grace City, I just want to welcome you. Um, and if maybe you've been coming a couple times and you're still looking to get uh, plugged in and connected with us, these connection cards are a great way to do that. Um, you can find those out in our courtyard at our Next Steps tent. Go ahead and fill one of those out and drop it into the box over there. Or uh, you can also feel free to drop it in our basket store in our offering. Uh, yeah, also outside you'll notice we have some goodies for you. It's our GC Cafe. It's all free and it's all for you. So feel free to take whatever you would like. Uh, which leads me to our last thing, which is family time. It's just an extended meet and greet period for you to uh, talk to your neighbor, meet someone new, and maybe check out the tents. It does feel nicer outside, so uh, be a good idea to go out there for these seven minutes. Uh, but yeah, it's seven minutes long, and we'll be having announcements shortly after. So yeah, see you guys then. Now the point at which we are saying is this. Now we have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven, a minister in the holy places, and the true tent that the Lord has set up, not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices. Thus, it is necessary for this priest also to have something to offer. Now, if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all, since there are priests who offer gifts according to the law. They serve a copy and shadow of the heavenly things. For when Moses was about to erect the tent, he was instructed by God, saying, See that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown you on the mountain. But as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is as much ex excellent than the old and as the covenant he mediates is better, since it is enacted on better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion to look for a second. For he finds fault with them when he says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I established a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. For they did not continue in my covenant, and so I showed no concern for them, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws into their hand, minds and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach each one his neighbor and each one his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall know me from the least of them to the greatest. For I will be merciful toward their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. And speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete, and what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. Let's pray. Uh, Father, I thank you for this morning that you are the bridge of our salvation. Thank you, Father, for showing us what, what it means to be in relationship with you. You are the high priest indeed, and I pray, Father, that we would recognize what that means today through Randall's message. In the name of Jesus, amen. Thanks, Jim Darn. All right, good morning. All right, this is your first time here. My name is Randall. I'm the lead pastor of Grace City. It's great to have you this morning. And I just have to say, you really wanted to be here this morning with all the traffic and everything that's going on out here. So thanks for being flexible. Um, came this morning for setup. We come to, at, for setup at 7 a.m. And uh, they, they just said, you know, that the, the custodial staff was like, hey, you know, there's some things out here you guys got to do, but then... Um, 
you know, there's about 2,000 people that are going to be on campus today. So it was just one of those side things, you know, like there's 2,000 people. So again, just thank you for being flexible with all the 2,000 people that are here with you. Um, so right now, if you're just joining us, we're in this series in the book of Hebrews, and we've been going through the book of Hebrews all summer long. And it's, a, it's an overview of this book, and we are in Hebrews chapter 8, verses 1 through 13 today. And the message is entitled, Jesus, Our Bridge. You know, what, what is it that the writer of Hebrews has been trying to get across to us all throughout the book? He continues to say it again and again, and here's what it is. It's the same message. Jesus is better. Jesus is better. He, he says it again in verse 6, if we're looking at the text today. He's saying, Jesus is better. And so today... What is it that holds us back from believing that that's true? Because for us today, that there's a reason that you are here today. You say, I want to connect with God. But what is it that holds us back from connecting with God? Well, there are many barriers, personal barriers that can keep us back from that in our lives. One of those barriers is the barrier of what I would call irreligion irreligion okay so it's this idea of like get religion out of here I don't want anything to do that with that but it's this idea that, that, that we say this God could never love me because I could never be good enough God could never love me because I, I, I could never be good enough I've done too much and gone too far for God to save me right so it's like I've gone off the track so far that there's no way that God could love me and we tell ourselves this and so it's an, a, a barrier what we call the barrier of irreligion there's another barrier and what it would be called is the barrier of religion and here's what it is i don't need god to be a good person i, I can follow the rules i can follow the ten commandments we, we we need to think of like even when jesus approaches this guy the young the rich young ruler Jesus says, how are you done on the Ten Commandments? How are you done on those? He says, I've, I've done actually pretty well. I'm good on that. I don't really need God to be a good person. I, I'm a good person and follow God's laws, so I deserve God's love. Now, we wouldn't say that out loud, but that is what we are thinking in our hearts. We are trying to earn God's love if I just follow the rules. See, but I want to say today that both of these ideas, whether we think it's a, it's a really noble thing to say, I've just gone too far, there's no way that God could love a person like me, or we've gone to this extreme where we say, okay, I followed the rules, and so God, I deserve to have your love, and you, you need to love me. I just want to say that both of these ways today are ways to avoid Jesus. They're ways to avoid Jesus. Flannery O'Connor, in her book, Wise Blood, wrote something really interesting. And I think this is applicable to us today. She says, there was a deep, black, wordless conviction in him that the way to avoid Jesus was to avoid sin. If I could just be good enough to avoid sin, then God will love me. But in the process, what we do is we try to avoid Jesus. We avoid Jesus because here's the gospel today. Here's the good news today. Whether you're on the barrier of irreligion or on religion, here's what it is. It's this. The gospel is this. Run to Jesus. Jesus is better. And it's when we admit that we desperately need him and we allow him to shape our lives that we start to see what a relationship with God truly is. See, because Jesus offers an invitation to a new way of thinking that goes against our ways of thinking about relating to God. Because for some of us, again, it's like if I just clean up my life, then I'm going to be close to God. But that's not it. Timothy Keller paints it in an interesting picture of this perspective of early Christians. So when we're looking at the book of Hebrews, we're talking about early Christians here. What was it that they struggled with? Well, here's what it would have sounded like during their day. He says, imagine... Early Christians talking to their neighbors in the Roman Empire. Ah, the neighbor says, I hear you are religious. Great, religion is a good thing. Where's your temple or holy place? We don't have a temple. Replies the Christian, Jesus is our temple. No temple? But where do your priests work and do their rituals? 
We don't have priests to mediate the presence of God, replies the Christian. Jesus is our priest. No priests? But, but where do you offer your sacrifices to acquire the favor of your God? We don't need a sacrifice, replies the Christian. Jesus is our sacrifice. What kind of religion is this, sputters the pagan neighbor? And the answer is, this Christian faith is so utterly different than how every other religion works that it doesn't really deserve to be called a religion. See, the gospel of Jesus, to be a Christian, is this offer from Jesus that is completely and utterly unique. It was unique during the days of early Christians, and it's unique to us today. Why? Because Jesus, he doesn't offer us things to do, but he offers us himself. He offers us himself. He said, would you receive me? You see, what is it that you and I need more than anything? A relationship. What is it that's, if I were to ask you, what is it the thing that changed your life more than anything? You would probably name someone and say it was a relationship with that person that helped change my life. See, we are wired for this. I talked about this before, but in June 2002, there was this conference at Dartmouth Medical School. Leading scientists, medical professionals were brought together to determine what is it that's causing this explosion of mental illness in the United States. And what these scientists discovered was found in this book, Hardwired to Connect. I tried to get my hands on this and I saw that it was going for $800 on Amazon. I'm saying, it's good, you're good. Like, I'll keep my money, I'm good. But human beings, here's what they say, fundamentally, are wired for relationships. And they were talking specifically about the youth in America at the time. They said they were experiencing, youth in America were experiencing two primary areas of relationships that were breaking down. The first uh, was just relationships with other people. The second one is a prime, this primary relationship is with God himself. Now, these are secular scientists coming together saying there's a breakdown in relationships leading to and contributing to mental illness. Secular scientists, connection with others, connection to God himself. What is it that Jesus came to bring us? A relationship with himself. Relationship with himself. And so text, our text today is Hebrews 8, 1 through 13. And, and just to give this setting, and we've been talking about through this book, this letter is written to city-dwelling Jewish Christians who were under immense amounts of persecution for their faith, and they were surrounded with different belief systems that were pressuring them to minimize their faith in Jesus. George Guthrie, who's a, a commentator on this, he says the author is comparing the Old Covenant of the Jewish faith and and the priesthood of the tabernacle over against the priestly heavenly Messiah, who's Jesus. The author expressly utilizes the contrast in order to bolster the commitment of Christians whose resolve was waning, who were tempted to return from the upstart, persecuted Christian community to the stable, long-standing traditions of Judaism proper. So they're being pressured, saying, okay, how should I relate to God? Everyone else around me says I have to do these rituals and do these things to relate to God. But Christianity is different. And so how can we see in this text that Jesus is greater and that he's our bridge to God? Well, the author shares this with us in three ways, and he shows us them um, through, number one, showing us the gap, number two, the offering, and number three, the gift. The gap, the offering, and the gift. So as we break down today's text, you're gonna see it all throughout. So starting in verse uh, one and two, we see the gap. So let's read together. Now the point in what we were saying is this. We have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven, a minister in the holy places, in the true tent that the Lord set up, not man so as we saw back in chapter one of hebrews we are seeing it now again 
What we see is the author is telling us there's this heavenly picture of Jesus. He said, remember this in chapter one. It it says this in verses three through four in Hebrews one. It says, he is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name as uh, he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. So you remember that from chapter one? There is this lofty, high view of Jesus that we see in Hebrews chapter one. And so now the author, again, in chapter eight, is pulling us in. He's saying, hey, I want you to gaze upon Jesus again because it's easy for you to gaze on the things that you need to do and the rituals that you need to perform. But hold on. I know everybody else around you is doing this, but let me show you Jesus again. And so, firstly, when we look at Jesus, what we see is this. He says that Jesus is a high priest. Look at verse one. We have such a high priest. And so the priest we see in the Old Testament was the one that would come for the people as the the representative for the people to come before God to offer sacrifice. So we see above everything, like, again, don't look at man Look at God and look at what God has given us in Jesus. He's, again, he's pointing us back to Jesus saying, look, he's the high priest. Secondly, we see that he's a king. Look, um, it says that he's seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. And so Jesus is enthroned in majesty. He's a king. Thirdly, we see his dwelling place. We see that it says that he ministers in the holy places in the true tent that the Lord set up, not man. So the description that we're getting here is this heavenly vision of who Jesus is, what he's done, and what he's accomplished. What is his role? This is his role. He is high and lifted up. And as we look at our own lives, and we think of the ways that we try to relate to God, there is no way that we could fill that gap. There's no way. See, there's this huge gap because when we look at ourselves and we look at Jesus, he's high and lifted up. F.F. Bruce says this. He says, by contrast with all material sanctuaries, this one is called the true or real sanctuary. The only one which is not an imitation of something better than itself. The only one which... Uh, whose durability comes anywhere near to matching the eternity of the living and true God whose dwelling place it is. For some of us, we've walked into ornate buildings filled with statues and things that are there to represent heavenly things. But this text is telling us that it is only a shadow of what the true eternal kingdom in Jesus looks like. Jesus is high and lifted up and he is in those places, the holy places, it says. See, the first two verses address the gap between man and God. The holiness of God. The high and lifted upness of God. And really, how we could never match that. Do you see how the gap is created there? Within ourselves, within myself, I have no right to approach this holy God. It's much like Isaiah when he meets God for real. Remember that, Isaiah chapter six? It says he falls on his face. It says I'm from an unclean people of an unclean lips. Like, God, I don't deserve to be in front of you. And that verse is interesting because many think that the reason he talks about his lips is he, he, he was... Isaiah was known as like a a really good communicator. Like his greatest gift was communication. And he says, even the best part of me is unclean before a holy God. Gap, right? We have nothing to present to God that could fill that gap. That's a desperate situation. And so we see that. But then we get the, the second point, the offering. Look at verses three through six. For every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices. Thus, it is necessary for the priest also to to have something to offer. Now, if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all, since there are priests who offer gifts according to the law. They serve a copy and shadow of the heavenly things. For when Moses was about to erect the tent, 
He was instructed by God saying, see that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown you on the mountain. But as it is, Christ has obtained a, a ministry that is as much more excellent than the old as the, the covenant he mediates is better uh, since he, it is enacted on better promises. And so now, we see that there's this distinction of two offerings. So in, in the, the first part, and look at verse three, it says, for every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices. See, what this is, is talking about there was, a, the, there was in the Old Testament offerings and sacrifices that were being brought to God, right? But does God need offerings and sacrifice from us? Well, no. God himself says, I don't, I don't need your burnt offerings. I don't need these things. But what is it all pointing to, right? It, it says that all of this was just a shadow to, to serve, they serve a, a copy. So what they were holding on to was these offerings and these sacrifices, but at the end of the day, if God's not in it, all it is is man-made offerings trying to fill the gap between us and God. All it is, it's just our attempt to get our way to God. See, and I want to say this today, this is what every other religion in the world is based off of. If you were to boil it all down, it's all based off of trying to fill the gap to get our way to God. See, some of us are doing it right now and we don't even realize it. And as much as we try to explain the gap away, because what we've done in our society, modern society, is we say, well, there is no God, there is no gap What's happened within our society is actually we've started to realize that it's probably true. Um, there, there's a, a man named Stanley Fish. He's um, a scholar, a, a professor. He's, he's not a Christian. He's actually very far from it. But he wrote this article called One University Under God. And he wrote it in 2005. And the whole point of his his argument here was, he said, okay, he, he'd been asked, like, what, 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 what is it that's next? Right, in, in the scholarly world, I, we've, we've gotten rid of God, what is next? And he says, there's something that's stirring, there's something that's rising. He says, um, when Jacques Derrida died, who was a leading uh, atheist thinker, and philosopher, he says, I was called by a reporter who wanted to know what would succeed high theory and the um, tri triumvirate um, of race, gender, and class as the center of intellectual energy in the academy. I answered like a shot religion. What he talks about in this article is he says, there are kids that are more interested today in religion because they're starting to find that this idea that there is no God doesn't work. And so they're very interested in all these religious classes and wanting to know this. So what we're starting to find, even as we've started to reject God, is that there is a gap. I want to know who God is. I want to know how to connect to him. But we need to understand how this gap works. Because Isaiah 64, 6 tells us, we have all become like one who is unclean and all our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. What is the Bible telling us? Again, the same thing, that as we try to make these offerings on our own strength, on our own ability, and try to bring them before a holy God, we can't bridge the gap between us and God. And so what's the answer? Well, what we find is Jesus is the offering. Jesus is the offering. So the, the way that we can live is, okay, I need to fill the gap with my offering or I can receive and accept the offering that Jesus gives before God. Verse six says, but as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is much more excellent than the old as the covenant he mediates is better since it is enacted on better promises. Well, what are these promises? Well, we see this picture of Jesus going back to verse two on a throne. But do you see how Jesus is on the throne? It says he's seated on the throne. What this is telling us is this, that the offering's already done. The offering 
is already finished. See, we don't see Jesus up there pacing in front of the throne saying, I wonder how that gap's gonna be filled, right? He's not thinking to himself, oh man, what are they gonna do to get their way to me? How are they gonna get up there? Can they reach high enough? Maybe I'll just reach down a little bit and just kind of pull them up. No. It says he's seated on the throne because the, the only way to get to God is to know Christ. The offering's done. It happened 2,000 years ago on a cross, dying for our sins. I have three kids. My second uh, child, Elle, she's that classic middle child, you know? She's the classic middle child, and she is so sweet. I love her. But the thing with her is she loves to compare herself. She's got that comparison trap, right? And so we were hiking yesterday, uh, doing a little family hike for my other daughter, uh, the youngest, Ava. It was her birthday, and so my daughter wanted to go on a hike. She's like, I want to go to Annie's Canyon. That's her favorite one. So we went up there, and we were hiking through there, and, um, and I'm parking the car because it was just packed out. And so the kids were going up a little further with, with my wife, uh, down the trail and so I'm running trying to get to him and then I see just my my middle daughter running back screaming mad shoe falling off I'm like oh great what's happening you know and so I come up to her I said what's what's wrong sweetie what's going on she says my brother and sister they're racing me and they're trying to get ahead of me and I'm just trying to get to the top and I want to be in front and I want to be first said well let's just try to figure your shoe out first and so I try to put that back on I you know put her shoe back on and we start walking and I said why is it that you need to be first well I just need to be first in front of them because they make fun of me and I, I and she's just going she's spiraling right she's got all of these things going on in her head and, and really what it is in her heart is she's trying to search for something that'll make her feel like she has worth and so I said, okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, because your shoe keeps falling off, I'm going to give you a piggyback ride, and we're just going to walk the whole way. And you know what? We're not going to care anymore about what brother and sister are doing. They can win. Doesn't matter. We're going to walk together because what's happening is your brother and sister, they're running, but they're missing all the beauty around them. They're missing it. And so we're just going to walk together, and you're going to ride on my back, and we're going to talk. And I'm going to talk with you about why it is that you feel like you need to be first. And so we started talking about that, and I said, you know what? Isn't it nice to just walk through life knowing that things are done? It doesn't really, like, you can enjoy things, right? And I'm telling her about Jesus, and that, you know what? You can rest in what God has done for you, and you don't have to be first anymore because Jesus was first for you. And so we can walk along and have a great time and not worry about that thing inside of you that's just resting around trying to make an offering to make yourself feel worthwhile, right? She's just walking, hanging out with dad. And that's what it means to rest in the gospel is that thing that's inside of you that's trying to fill a gap that make, make you feel like you're worthwhile, make you feel like you're enough. It, when you know that Jesus is seated on the throne, you know that it's finished. And I actually don't have to prove anything anymore. I don't have to live that way anymore. But I can rest in what Jesus has done for me. And I can enjoy everything that's around me. And so that's the gospel, right? You don't have to run that rat race anymore and to prove yourself to God or somebody else because you can rest in Jesus. Timothy Keller, again, he says this. This is really helpful for us. He says, every other religion says, do this, give this, offer this, live this, experience this. And that will send you over the gap to God. But Jesus says, I'm the God who at infinite cost to myself has come over the gap, has come over the barriers to you. Barriers and a gap that you, with your puny little religious observances, would never have been able to bridge. But I've come to you. That's the gospel. He has done it. He has bridged the gap. Would you receive him? Because lastly, it's this, the gift. Look at verses 10 through 12. And this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. 
I will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach each one his neighbor and each one his brother saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest. For I will be merciful toward their iniquities and I will remember their sins no more. You see, as we see Jesus seated on the throne, as we see that he is our mediator, he's the one that's offered the greatest offering for us, what happens is we start to settle down and realize that the gift is right in front of us, the greatest gift of all. You see it in verse 11, and they shall not teach each one his own neighbor and each one his brother saying, know the Lord for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest. They shall know me. What was it that we talked about a couple weeks ago? It was to know the Lord. To know the Lord. That, that, that's the greatest gift of all, is to know God. And so what we see here is that God is offering himself to us through Jesus and saying, you can really know me. You know one of the biggest hang-ups in our culture is we get so hung up on, I need to know myself. I need to know me. I don't even know me. And so we just struggle and struggle and struggle. You know what? The Bible tells us that your heart is deceptive and mine is too. And if you're so concerned and I'm so concerned about knowing myself, right, there's some good things that you can know about yourself. But when that's my primary concern, it says I'll be really confused because we don't even know our own hearts. The only one that knows our hearts is God. And so when you know God, actually when it says that you place God first and you start to know God and you know that he's the greatest gift, you know what? You'll start to actually know who you are. You'll actually find out who you are you'll start to listen to the truth about who you are because you know who's going to be telling you? The only one who knows who you are. And that is a gift to be known by God and for him to know you inside and out and to love you and me. When we see the gap in between us, when I see my sinfulness, when I'm embarrassed about how sinful I truly am, that God would be willing to love me to know God is the gift. See, when I was younger, I was, I was spending some time with my, my parents this week, and I started to think a lot about my grandparents. They passed away um, right around the time we were planting this church. I did a funeral for them. Um, you know, and, and just thinking about my grandparents, um, when I was younger, all I really cared about was what can I get out of grandma and grandpa today? You know what I mean? Let's be honest. That, that's, that's the ugly side, isn't it? It's like, what, what, what is it? Maybe grandma can hook me up with some new shoes. Maybe grandma can hook me up with some cool clothes. Maybe grandma can, we, you know, it's just, and the thing about grandma is she lived across the street from the mall. Okay. <laughs> so it was like, okay, cool. Like walking distance. Great. But I think back and just how immature I was at that point. And what I wanted was the gift of those things more than the gift of being present with my grandparents. And I remember my grandma one day, she was like looking at me and we were about to cross the street and there was this older like teenager. She's like, when you're their age, you're not gonna wanna hang out with me. I said, nah, grandma, that'll never happen. You know, and I look back and I think to myself just how many times I thought that the gift was the things that she got me. But then as they got older in age and I got older and wiser, the greatest gift was being with them. And do you see that the greatest gift is knowing God? Not the things that God can give you because you're gonna have ups and downs in life, but it is knowing that he's there with you through it all. 
That's the greatest gift of all. And so just some takeaways real quick to help us think through this. Let me ask this. How does Jesus bridge the gap in our lives? Let me ask three questions. Number one, do you believe that God could come near to you? Do you believe that God could come near to you? Because, you, again, it's that idea of irreligion. It's that barrier that we just keep going back to again and again and saying, there's no way that God could love me because you don't know all the things that I've done. I mean, I've heard people before say, I can't come to your church because, well, if I walked inside, I might get struck by lightning. Like that type of idea, right? But what is that? It's thinking that my sin is greater than the grace of God. And I just want you to know today that whatever you've done and whatever your sin that you're struggling with right now, it's not greater than the grace of God. That the grace of God and what Jesus has done on the cross is greater than your sin. Could you believe that? Because if we believe that, we would go running to Jesus. We would run to him instead of hiding out with our sin and holding on to our sin and saying, look at how, look at how good I am. I've got it all together. We can be honest. Say, here it is, Jesus. But that's the barrier of irreligion. And so today, do you believe that God could come near to you? Second, do you believe that the gospel is about receiving, not earning? Like that the good news is about receiving, not earning. Because some of this comes back to the reason why you don't pray and I don't pray and the reason why we don't read our Bibles it's because we think to ourselves, well, it's just been so long and, and I have to like do it, you know, like checklist and so I feel terrible that I didn't do it in the past week and so there's no way that I can open up right now. It's just all about these rules and rules and rules and rules and rules. And we think that we're trying to earn something from God. And I just want you to know that today Jesus has done it all. He's lived it out perfectly. And so would you just come to Jesus and say, I need you. I, re I receive you. I receive all that you've done for me. Lastly, do you believe that knowing God is the greatest gift of all? Because when you start to say, like, what does gospel mean? It means good news. It means good news. And so when you start to see that God wants a relationship with you and God wants to be with you, it becomes the best news you've ever heard. And you start to tell other people about this, right? Because it's like the offering has been taken care of. It's all been done in Christ. So let me tell you the gospel today. It's this, that Jesus has bridged the gap for you. He's come near to us, so near that he became one of us. And he says, it's not about your earning because I will live the perfect life and die for every moment that you didn't live as you were supposed to. And it wasn't because we were good people that he did that. But it was purely out of his grace and mercy and kindness. You know what the Bible says? It says that his kindness leads us to repentance. And when you start to see the kindness of God and how kind he, he's been to us, you'll go running to him. You know, one person that could have said, look at all my accomplishments and look at all I've done was someone named the Apostle Paul. He said he was the Hebrew of Hebrews. I mean, look at Philippians 3, 5 through 11. This, we're going we're to end here. He says, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, you done enough stuff? You been a good person? He says, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel and of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless, but whatever gain I had, I counted it as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For this sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. And by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Again, we think we've done enough. We think we're good people. 
The Apostle Paul, he says, he's done more. And he says, I count it all as rubbish. Would you count it all as rubbish and cling to Christ? And when you do that, you'll find that Jesus is the bridge. He's the connection to God that you've been looking for your whole life. He's the thing we need more than anything. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for being with us. Thank you for the truth of the gospel this morning. That we don't cling to our works and our own righteousness, Lord, but there is a righteousness that comes from God and it is Jesus Christ. And so we cling tightly to him and to what he's done for us. We thank you for that great gift. We pray this all in Jesus' name, amen. All right, this morning, I just want to invite you, if you are a believer in Christ, to come to the table. Uh, this is our opportunity again to, to remind ourselves of the gospel. I'm not saved today because I got my life together, because I've been a good person. I'm saved because Jesus is the only good person. And so I cling tightly onto him, and I hold on to him, and I remember the gospel this morning by taking the juice and remember the blood that was spilt for me. And I take the bread the broken body of Jesus, the perfect broken body of Jesus. And I remember and take that and I remind myself again this week why we're saved. Not because we're good, but because Jesus is. And so when you're ready, you can come up to the front and take that um, back to your seats. Um, Take it on your own. Um, but take a moment to pray. You can pray with some of those around you. Um, But we do communion every week, and this is an opportunity, again, for us to remember Christ. If you're not a believer today, we ask that um, at the end, if if you want to know Christ, we have a care team that will be right up here at the end. We would love to tell you who Jesus is. But again, we don't want this to be a ritual, just a thing we do, a religious thing. We want it to mean something. And so if you're a believer today, we invite you to come to the table when you're ready. their song thrown into a sea without bottom or shore our sins they are many his mercy is more patience would wait as we Constantly, what Father so tender is calling us home? Oh, He welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Praise the Lord. His mercy.
blood was the payment, his life was the cost. We stood neath the death we could never afford. Our sins, they are many, his mercy.
Amen. It's so true. It's so true. And so as we wrap up today, uh, these are my friends all the way from Savannah that came this week. They're going to be uh, just praying for our church, and then they're going to be helping out with the sports camp. And, um, you know, I just want to share, like, there are a lot of people, like, our, our church started over three, three and a half years ago, and it started through prayer. And so I remember the first time, I've been friends with David for a long time, and David, um, I remember sitting at a Starbucks in Savannah, Georgia, and I just said, hey, I think God's calling me to go plant a church in San Diego, and my friend called, and all these things, and, um, and he gave me the scripture from John 15, and he said, um, you know, you can do nothing apart from Jesus. He said, just keep preaching Jesus and keep pointing to Jesus. He's like, I'm gonna pray for you. We're gonna support you all the way from there. And there are people all across the country that do that for this church. And so that's, that's the only way we're here. It's because of the grace of God. And so I've asked um, David if he would pray for the sports camp coming up this week and also um, just for our church as we end service today. So, David. Father, uh, I think of the scripture that we did not choose you, but you chose us, and you chose us to bear fruit, much fruit, lasting fruit. Father, I thank you for Randall's obedience to come to this place. Um, Father, I thank you for the gift that he talked about today. That is gift is you. Father, that you bridge the gap for each and every one of us. Thank you, Father, for what you've done for us. Father, we lift up this campus today, uh, each and every person here, every family represented, that your hand of favor and blessing would be on them. Father, I pray that you give them boldness to uh, deliver your message to people around them that need you as well, Father. Lord, we ask that you would bless this camp this week, that you would use these children to bring families to you, to come to know you, that you would bridge the gap for all of us, Lord. We thank you for your grace, for your mercy, for your love. We thank you that you loved us enough to die for us. We pray all this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right, um, we're going to have our care team up here up front. We would love to pray with you, talk with you through anything that you're going through, anything that you need. I'll be up front here too. If this is your first time, I'd love to meet you. Grace City, have a great week. You're sent.